So now it's time for the main event. Day one of the Lightning Talks. Oh! It's working. Today we have 10 speakers scheduled. There's room for 10 more tomorrow and the following day. They are not yet all full. If you would like to submit a Lightning Talk, the link is through the conference website. Just go submit it all in. If you have submitted one or are in the process of doing it, please find me between now and then to say hello and that I know you're here and we'll get everything set up. Tomorrow for the lightning talks, come up during the afternoon cookie break. Make sure your laptop works. Sit in the first two rows here and everything will work fine. If you want to give an advertisement during the gap while they're messing with their computers and switching, while someone's messing with their computers and switching, move up to the front, off to the side, and then come up to the microphone here to give your advertisement. If you're giving an advertisement and they're still clapping for them, you can wait. I won't count it against you. If you're about to plug in your computer and start speaking and they're still clapping for some reason for the advertiser, go ahead and wait. I won't count it against you. We have five minutes. At four minutes, I will ring the bell which I stupidly left over there, so we're just going to have to trust me that it makes a bell sound. <laughs> <laughs> At five minutes, I will hit the gong, which I think by now you've all heard. So... Oh. Okay. Uh, and for advertisements, particularly today, I would like the people who are running a boff to come up. Or if you've picked out a restaurant from the list on, that you can find on the wiki, things to eat, come up, say where you're going to go eat and where in this room or out front you will be standing so you can gather a crowd and take them with you. Don't leave any stragglers. And we will go ahead and get started now. Hey everyone, I'm Nick Patch and I'm here to talk about stemming. Who here has used a stemmer? Okay, a handful of people out there. So um, what a stemming algorithm is, is you take a word, you run it through your stemmer, and then you get the stem. It's kind of like a root, and I'll go into why you might want to do this. So first off, we have a few people who know about stemming in the audience. Um, what do you think the stem of hacking is? Hack. Okay, hack, very good. Uh, hacker. And of course, hack is just hack. So we get a stop common stem for each of these words. Then say, what about gurgled? Yeah, gurgled, but you know, it, it may not be uh, an actual word itself. A stem isn't necessarily a word. It's just a common portion of a word uh, for related terms. So gurgling is gurgle. Notice how the original word has an E after the L on one of them and an I after the other. So we just chop it all off and we get this common, you know, G-U-R-G-L. Different stemming algorithms can, can do different things. You should use the same stemming algorithm for the same language when you're comparing two stems. So let's take a look at how we might use this. Uh, let's stem hacker again. We get hack and uh, compare it to the stem of hacking. Well, obviously, I, this is true. And we commonly use this in uh, search engines. So at Shutterstock, we support search in 20 languages. And we use a lot of stemmers uh, for various different languages to compare words. So here you might uh, index the stem of hacker and then look up the stem of hacking. To re uh, and then you'll have a result. And there are a bunch of different stemming algorithms on CPAN. Uh, ones, they're competing ones, and there are ones that just support an individual language, but they, the problem is that they have all different interfaces. And some of them expect character strings, some of them ex expect byte strings, possibly in UTF-8 encoding, possibly in various other encodings. Uh, and don't get me started about passing byte strings around. So. Uh, we created this unified interface, Lingua Stem Any, that just uh, supports all of the stemming algorithms on CPAN as backends. It has a, a good sane defaults for uh, ones to use, and there are 21 different languages that it currently supports and growing. 
Here's just a simple example of using it. You instantiate your lingua stem any object for a specific language, and then you call the stem method, pass in your word, retrieve the stem. I'm, there are, there's also a lot of functionality that the current stemmers on CPAN don't have, like there's the uh, cache attribute here to enable caching. I uh, say you're doing a lot of stemming of the same words and uh, this is a performance boost. Then you can set stemming exceptions, say words you don't want to stem at all or words you want to stem to something entirely different than what the stemming algorithm will do. As well as by default Unicode case folding and Unicode normalization. Uh, as opposed to most of the CPAN stemmers just do lowercase uh, as part of their stemming. And you can stem a single word, a list of words, or stem an array ref in place. So let's take a look at also some new stemmers that have been added to CPAN in the last year. Uh, there's Czech, because this is a language that we started supporting at Shutterstock. Um, and we've got this bundle of stemmers in Lingua Stem U9, which stands for University of Neuchatel. They define a bunch of different stemming algorithms. And uh, don't worry about the funny capitalization in U9, because just use Lingua Stem any and don't think about uh, even you know, calling Lingua Stem U9. Then Bulgarian and even uh, Persian, also known as Farsi, which for all of these, these are the first stemmers on CPAN for these languages. But you may not need to use any of these because I just recently released an Esperanto stemmer <laughs> for the international language. So as soon as Esperanto catches on as the international language, you won't have to use any of the others. And I know there are some critics in the audience who don't believe that will happen. So for them, I released uh, an Edo stemmer. <laughs> and I, you know, this covers all of the world languages now. I, but what about the intergalactic languages? Nice. I, how about a Klingon stemmer? Unfortunately, I don't speak Klingon. But I, later this week, I am seeing Paul Fenwick. So maybe we can uh, set something up. A few other stemmers that are on the way are uh, Polish, Arabic, Bengali, Hindi, and Marathi. Uh, none of which, other than a, a basic one of Arabic, are available on CPAN. So, thanks everyone. Hi. Uh, some of you may know and some of you may not know that we are having official movie nights this year. Uh, we've had bad movie night for about a decade at Yapsi unofficially. Uh, this year they've asked me to do a good movie night as well as a bad movie night. Tonight is good movie night. Uh, I don't know the exact location yet. It's on the 11th floor, but I will be posting it on the wiki as soon as I find out what it is. Uh, it starts at 9 o'clock, and you are all welcome. Thank you. That is really broken. Apparently not. Thanks. That looks better. Okay. So, it's about uh, Devel Confess. So, um, Perl has uh, exceptions, um, and they're not all that great. They're kind of shitty, actually. Um, they're basically how you do exceptions in Perl is with die. Um, <coughs> And you just give it a string that's an error, and it reports where that error is. There's some problems with this, though, because um, it's based on the location that the die was, um, and not where really what caused the error, which is the thing that called it usually. Um, also, it only gives you this one line of context, uh, which is not always very helpful. Um, so. <sighs> 
<laughs> there are solutions to this. The first one is using uh, carp. You use croak instead of die. Um, and so now we get a location based on the uh, <coughs> what actually caused the error as opposed to uh, the location that you listed that you actually died from. So that's helpful. Um, we also get confess, which allows you to have a full stack trace instead of just one line of the error. Uh, but what if this code isn't code you wrote? This is somebody else's module you're interfacing with. Uh, so there was a module written to solve this problem called carp always, where you simply add carp always as a module you load, and it gives you the full stack trace for all exceptions. Um, so yeah, this, this, it gives you full stack traces for die, croak, confess, anything like that, including internal Perl errors like syntax errors, etc. Um, it also has a thing for giving, doing this for warnings. Uh, but for example, when you try to use this with other things like, say, uh, DBIX class, uh, what happens when we add carp always in this case? Uh, nothing. We don't get any extra context. We don't get a stack trace. The problem here is that DBIX class uses exception objects instead of strings. Uh, the way carp always and carp work is by just taking the string of the error message or warning and adding um, <coughs> our, the context to the end of it. And it's a string, so it's easy to modify. That doesn't really work with objects, because you destroy the object if you do that, and other handlers can't handle it as an object like you should. So instead, they just pass them through unmodified. Uh, so to solve this, I wrote devel confess. It was based on the same concept, uh, it add, but it adds stack traces to ex exception objects as well, and also works for bare references in case anyone ever uses that. Uh, so we can replace our uh, devel confess or use, um, sorry, seemed to have skipped a little far. And we get all of our context information now. And it also has a sh little short flag of dash D. So it's even less typing, which is fun. Um, so the advantages here include stack traces for exception objects. Uh, it also does some other things to give you better uh, context for anonymous subs and evals. Um, it can be disabled if you need to do that. It also has kind of fewer prerequisites, uh, which matters to some people. Um, it also has some extra features. Uh, there was other variations on this concept on CPAN uh, that gave you uh, colored warnings and errors, uh, would dump m uh, the contents of the arguments instead of just references, or would show you source information. So I stuck all of those in as well. Um, you use the dump option, and it t shows you the contents of references instead of just the address. Uh, you give it color, and you get color-coded warnings and errors. Um, it has support for handling built-in uh, exception objects, so it'll detect other exception objects that are being used and not do its own magic. Uh, and you can also disable stuff, uh, and you can get the highlighted source for the, for the entire context. Uh, how does this actually work? Um, we use die handler. Um, it's handled calls for, called for all errors, or warn handler. Um, but what we actually do is, well, the warning silences the warning unless we output it ourselves. Or the die, you can't silence the error, but you can just override it by dying. Um, what we do is we generate a subclass uh, of the exception object uh, that will show the stack trace and re-bless into that. So it's kind of ugly and awful. We save the, the uh, stack trace, store externally, we generate a package, uh, and then we inherit from the original class and bless into it. It's, it's awful. And then it, it, there's all this magic for stringification that it, it has to re-bless into the original thing. It's fun. Um, why did I fork instead of just uh, using the original? Uh, it's, there's a lot of complexity here. It can interfere with code in other ways. Carp always is incredibly simple, and I, I talked to the author about this, and he wanted to just keep it as a dead simple module, so I just used a separate thing. So everyone should use this. I like it, um, and thanks for the original module.
Uh, and, hi, Jane Hack. Um, and uh, where, where's Yannick? Just in case, is, are you knitting at the moment? Okay. So uh, there's going to be a dancer buff. Um, so we're just going to chat about what's going on in dancer one, two, everything. It's uh, tomorrow, Tuesday, 11 a.m. at the Pineas. Did I get that right? Uh, third floor. So if you want to come, Yannick and I will be there and uh, you can go to the weekend register and that's about it. Thank you. Um, one second. Where's my mouse? Unless I put the chair for that. Yay. Okay. Uh, so I'm Zach Zabrowski. Um, I am uh, a Perl guy. I do database stuff at work. Uh, but uh, I also teach a course on uh, security, uh, specifically web browser security. So I'm going to give you a flavor for that. The presentation here is at b.zaxe.us slash b.html. Or if you uh, go to uh, opensecuritytraining.info, there is a ton of full day courses all about uh, security training. Uh, this is just one of many. And it's actually have uh, full YouTube videos and all that good stuff. And it's all Creative Commons licensed. And if anyone uh, is interested in any of that stuff, uh, let me know. Uh, it's all good stuff. Um, this is a five minute version of my full day course, so this is slightly abbreviated. Uh, but it should be uh, good info, and if anyone's interested, I can talk with you later about any of the content. I'm, I'm happy to talk. Um, so, reminder, that you learn, uh, what you learn here, use for good, not evil, uh, because good things are good. Um, so we're going to talk briefly about uh, the characteristics of internet connections. Um, we're going to talk about ways of identifying who your end users are. And then we're going to briefly talk about ways to obfuscate uh, where you're coming from. Uh, so there's good cases for both of these. Uh, if you are uh, a bank user, you want to make sure that uh, if you are uh, someone that is accessing your bank, you want to make sure that you're coming from the US as compared to the UK or something like that. Um, so there are three main characteristics of any internet connection, which is the first one is um, uh, when are you connecting to the internet? Because that's important because you uh, most people are awake when they connect to the internet. So that's a good way of trying to identify where people are. Um, where, uh, uh, I'm sorry, when do you act, the, 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 what device is connecting to the internet? Uh, people, uh, uh, that's, that's one thing you have to do is you use a device to connect to the internet, so that's an important thing. How are you connecting? Uh, there is Wi-Fi, there is dial-up, there is uh, Fios, a whole bunch of different options. Each of those have different characteristics and are ways to identify you. Um, there is uh, IP geolocation is basically a database of IP addresses and location ad, uh, information. Uh, this is derived by two main ways of doing it. These are both open source techniques. Um, one is hostip.info uh, is asking you know, basically the user, where are you? Uh, query who is registries uh, is another way of doing it. This is from Software 77, which is actually based in South Africa. Um, and MaxMind uh, is, uh, is one example of this data. Uh, for when I was in Arlington, Virginia, which is where, where, I'm, where I live, uh, it, re it returned a neighboring city for where I thought my IP geolocation was. Uh, that actually makes sense because uh, when uh, IP addresses um, are, for the most part, static when you're uh, connecting uh, through an internet uh, service provider. However, if, if there's a major storm outage, data changes, and it takes a while for databases to update. Um, so here's a, some Perl content, yay. Uh, there's a bunch of Perl modules that, that allow you to do IP geolocation lookups within Perl. 
Uh, these are the, the modules that do that. Um, there, you can also be, when you just connect to the internet, you are also um, allowing users to, to the server to identify who you are. Uh, you can, uh, you, the, by just making the connection, you, you know the remote IP address of the user. Uh, you can do a DNS lookup on that to give you more information. The user agent, which is actually the type of browser that you're using, can also give you more information about uh, the server, about w what you're doing. If you go to zach.freeshell.org slash emv.pl, you can see uh, what uh, the browser is returning for your particular information. Uh, there is HTTP Browser Detect, which is a Pro module that uh, lets you know if you're using a mobile device or something like that. Uh, there is also JavaScript techniques. Uh, if you go to penupclick.eff.org, it uses JavaScript and other techniques to identify fonts uh, and also the size of your screen, which is great for identification purposes. Um, JavaScript Location API is a new feature of HTML5, which returns very accurate information about where your browser is. It's a little bit scary. I strongly recommend you look at it. Um, and if, if you want to borrow network connections, that's a great way to obfuscate where you're coming from. So uh, just by going to a nearby hotel and saying I'm a guest user, that's one way to obfuscate your location if, you're, uh, if your actual location is somewhere in the city. Um, there's also the application called Tor, which is reasonably popular in the news. Uh, uh, that's a, a great way for people to anonymize their locations. There are a bunch of caveats associated with any technique that you need to be aware of. Um, basically, um, if you're using an anonymous application and there is a, uh, there, and if, if you, are, you are convinced or the browser in, is convinced into doing something that it shouldn't, you, you might lose your anonymity. So with all that said, um, uh, ask me later. Pearl, yay. Hello, uh, I am Uri. I'm the Pearl Hunter. I hunt down Pearl people and kill them dead. Pearl isn't dead. Uh, I'm always looking for people to hire, get jobs for them, clients to help people get job, get them out, uh, right Pearl people. So I have a Pearl Jobs buff tomorrow at lunchtime on the 14th floor lounge. Uh, we're getting pizza. You got to let me know what you're going to get. We'll have pizza and some soda there. Um, Pay for your own pocket out of pizza, but we'll figure that out later. Um, okay, just catch me anytime you want. I'm here all week. Uh, you know, tip your waiters. Bye. Hello. So, who in here knows what the Pearl Advent Calendar is? Oh, not enough people. Okay, the Pearl Advent Calendar is an Advent Calendar where you get a new Pearl module, a review of it, uh, once a day over Christmas. Now, it started 14 years ago when our local Pearl mongers went to the bar. But anyway, it ended up with me writing an article every uh, 25 articles every year. And I got burnt out, and it got taken over by many people. Most recently, Rick has been herding people to help write articles and this year we want to start early rather than starting it near Christmas so I'm looking for people to help write articles now uh, many of you are sitting there thinking I can't write an article on Pearl well you can because it's mainly just a war story about your favorite module or what you've done with it or exciting things like that so come find me uh, or join our mailing list uh, tinyurl.com slash Pearl Advent and uh, help us write an article It worked earlier. Hey, good morning. Uh, my name's Steve. I'm from Milwaukee. Um, I, <laughs> I'm, not, 
I'm an alcoholic. No. <laughs> we all are. I'm from Milwaukee. No. <laughs> um, I suggested a scalability buff, so I'm stuck uh, doing the scalability buff. It's uh, it's my first buff, so it's going to be amazing. So you guys should come. Um, as an example, I do a web application development, so there's times where it's not going as fast as I'd like it. So, um, so I'm trying to get some advice on some new techniques I can use. So I'm hoping that it's not just a bunch of people that are struggling. If you guys are scalability experts, scalability experts, and uh, can give some advice, that'd be awesome to have you guys there to share some success stories. So join us today at 4 o'clock up on the third floor, also in the Pinellas. So hope you can help us out. Thanks. All right, so in uh, 2008, uh, I don't have slides. Yeah, so in 2008, um, I have hardware, not slides. So in 2008, I invited Alicia Gibb from Bug Labs to come and speak at Pittsburgh Pearl Workshop. And most everyone there was kind of confused, um, including myself. Um, but what I knew is that hardware was cool and awesome, and I'd been a tinkerer. Um, for a long time. I grew up having similar things. I hope most of you had something similar to this. Um, but they're cooler now than they used to be. Um, and we can add things like Arduinos to them and all kinds of cool stuff. But anyway, so Alicia came and she was talking about Bug Labs and a lot of more was being talked about running Perl on the Bug Labs tool. And you don't have to know what that is if you don't know. Um, Alicia's gone on and she helped start the Open Source Hardware Association. So we're all FOSS people. We know free and open source software. It also is applied to hardware. But in those discussions with Alicia, uh, we were talking a lot about the democratization of hardware, which we as open source people, we don't always think about our free software is being democratized, but that's a big part of it. And the same thing is being happening, happening in hardware. More than all of that, we are reaching these points in hardware where you can provision infinite computing is the term that's being ballyhooed about, right? We can get on these cloud services, AWS, Linode, wherever, and just have infinite compute, and we can have it instantly, and we can have it for a while, and they can go away. And that's really very cool, and that's really where I'm thinking about hardware. That's not where you have to think about hardware. I am interested in how Perl used to be the glue language for systems. I see Perl being the glue language for everything. And what is everything? People talk about the Internet of Things. It's kind of become into the Internet of everything. And everything is just that. It is everything. From sending your drone, which is a great talk coming up about drones, but sending your drones to go take pictures and send them back, get them analyzed on the cloud. We can provision things so fast. We I mean, it is amazing to think of where we're going to be when you think about everything and all the possibilities that we can do. So if everything is big, right? Every, everything's pretty big. But if you combine everything with everything to make something new, then that's even bigger. But if you combine that with the infinite dreams of what those combinations can be, it's enormous. And I think Pearl can find a great place there dealing with everything. Um, but it needs to be easier. It needs to be really easy. Uh, I was talking to Matt Trout. Uh, I don't know where the hell he went. But Matt Trout was talking about, you know, he deals with catalysts and stuff because he hates the web. He wants to build tools that make it really easy for him to get in and out of that web interface. And I think some of us think that about hardware. You want to build things that are kind of abstract, kind of get that abstraction where you don't have to deal too much. A couple of great things happened in Perl hardware over the last few weeks. We got device Fermata pushed up to CPAN, which is a kind of a MIDI interface into microcontrollers, if you've done any MIDI, which is great. Um, we have people from the Dancer and Mojo communities that are starting to build web interfaces into that. So you'll be able to do like curl calls and use your whole Unix tool chain to start to flip bits and turn things on and move motors and read bits. Everyone knows how to do this stuff. We just need to get some thin layers to make it a much more approachable so everybody can be playing with this stuff. We have to get this abstraction stuff right. Um, and we have to encourage each other. I mean, some people all have like, ideas about how this should be. And it's all getting invented right now. So we're, I mean, if anyone thinks the internet is perfect, raise your hand, right? Because it's got problems all over the place, but it's still awesome. But everything is still getting invented right 
as we speak. Even though the Internet of Things has been here as long as the Internet, when you could talk to Coke machines and find out how many um, Cokes were in the machine and what their temperatures were at Carnegie Mellon in the early days of the Internet. But we still are like fledgling. Like I talk to most of my software friends here and they're like, I can't do hardware. And I argue you absolutely can do hardware. And we have a hardware hackathon set up. We have a whole room full of Arduinos, um, micros, uh, boards that you can borrow. I am completely fine with you taking this, borrowing it for the night. I don't care. I'm really excited about getting our software community excited about hardware and not just bringing our Perl code, but bringing our Perl values into that community. And when things are broken and confusing and hard to deal with, well, maybe they don't have to be. And maybe you're not going to write a Perl solution to solve the problem. Maybe it will be something in C or who knows what. But you'll still bring that value and that culture into that community. And trust me, trust me, we're going to do some amazing things. Because when we start connecting everything to everything, and we're able to reach out to CPAN and pull something down, or even something from another community, and just slam them together and make those dreams from everybody come to reality. People that really know very little about coding, we're going to make it accessible to them, like Perl did for uh, like the, the early days of the web, making it accessible. It's going to be awesome. I don't know what our little CGI PM will be um, that will be for hardware. That, but let's find out together. Come join us. I normally speak to about 20 people at a time, so I'm a little nervous. Um, you've seen this for a while. I'm JD, the Foo. Um, I'm from Atlanta, so I see Bruce out there. I uh, don't have a lot of time. Um, virtualization is all about uh, getting your CPU, your RAM, your disk I.O., your network I.O., and your graphics as fast as possible. So we'll just go through each of those in order. Um, but you have to remember on a VM, you are sharing. So um, you want to be a good, uh, a good neighbor to the other VMs running there. Uh, most of these things you can change easy later. So um, usually when you're, I, I'm a Linux-centric kind of guy, sorry. That's what I do. I run on Linux. Um, my uh, host OS is Linux and all my VMs are Linux unless I am forced to do something else. Um, under Linux, unless you're doing large-scale servers, one vCPU is what you want. Um, this works great for things like KVM and for um, VirtualBox. I don't usually deal with the commercial uh, VM providers anymore. Uh, you can always change that up if you need to. For RAM, you want to use the minimum amount uh, that's required for your system. Um, the goal for best performance is to avoid swapping. So um, I know Zimbra doesn't like to run on less than a gig and a half. Um, sometimes you need 1.8, and if you have thousands and thousands of users, you'll need a lot more than that. Boy, this is going a lot quicker than I thought. I, I normally talk for this uh, in, a, in about uh, two hours. So we go, go a lot deeper into this. Um, always leave RAM for the host OS. Uh, on Windows, you need to leave a gig. On um, Unix, a gig is good, but uh, 512 is usually enough so that it can manage all the VMs. Disk I.O. Uh, is a really complex topic. Um, for small servers and home servers, um, you, you want to pre-allocate or put them on SSDs. If they're on SSDs, uh, then you don't care. You don't have to pre-allocate anything. Uh, a, lot, a lot of um, virtual hosting providers will put you on NFS. Uh, I've had this Chromebook for about three months. It's not running Chrome OS. Uh, the first time it booted, it was wiped. Um, 
So if you need really fast performance, put them on SSDs. I don't care if you use sparse files or not. Otherwise, um, use fully pre-allocated files or use a direct, direct pass-through on your, v on your, um, uh, on your uh, partitions, either with the hardware or with uh, um, LVM. Uh, network is real simple. Uh, I didn't say this earlier. Uh, your client VMs don't know anything about what's going on on the host machine unless you let them know. Uh, so they see virtual hardware. They're not seeing the real hardware. So um, inside your client, it doesn't matter if you have Wi-Fi as the real, uh, uh, as the real network connection. Um, inside your client, give them a, either a vert IO, like, and you want to use vert IO for the drivers whenever possible, uh, or give them an Intel Pro 1000 um, as, as the NIC. Uh, you don't want to be slowed down um, Within the, within the client architecture. Um, in those um, virtualization tech, uh, technologies that use guest editions, always install those. Um, they give it a tighter integration. And, uh, um, but, but on Linux, Vert.io is easy for disk and for um, uh, the networking. Ooh, I left off some stuff because I was worried I was going to be long. So in summary, um, you want to pre-allocate the virtual hard drive whenever possible. So if you need 20 gigs, give it 20 gigs, unless you're on SSDs. Um, for Linux, use Vert.io for your drivers. Um, on in, on uh, Windows, use um, the Intel Pro 1000 uh, uh, and SATA drivers. Uh, you can add the Vert.io drivers, uh, but I haven't found that the performance difference really matters that much. Um, but going from IDE to SATA, which I guess people still run XP, um, it is about a 40% performance improvement. It's really that much different. Um, start off with one vCPU. You don't need more than that. Use the recommended amount of um, client-side uh, uh, RAM. And uh, make sure you leave enough RAM for the host OS to manage all your virtual machines. Hit the gong, please. <laughs> of February 7 and 8, that will be FOSDEM. FOSDEM is the biggest open source event in the world. Uh, six, six to seven thousand people, 25 concurrent tracks. One of them is Pearl, I organize that. We have something like 15 to 25 speakers uh, on a day. Uh, it, it's awesome. All, every year it's getting awesomer. L this year it was extra awesome. Um, if you're in Europe next year, February, come to FOSDEM. Enjoy. Thank you. They'll just no, it's fine. They don't actually need to be here. Okay. Um, we'll just mock them later. Um, hi, I'm Sungo. Um, <laughs> I'm just a jackass, not an alcoholic. Um, so, how many of you know we have an irc.pearl.org? Excellent. How many of you actually use it? All right, cool. So, if you have not been paying attention. Um, we've undergone some changes. We want to make sure everyone's aware of it and want to make sure that you're aware that we're having a boff about it. Um, very recently, we came up with the standards of conduct for the IRC network. Um, and it is in place for the network now. Um, it has nice anti-harassment policies, the whole nine yards, um, to sort of hopefully allay some fears. Um, in theory, the SOC is drafted to be just what we're doing already. Um, with some nice guidelines for how you deal with people that aren't. Um, but in theory, for the most part, it's what we're already doing. We're not intending to change the network at all. Um, we are also in the process of creating a governance policy to deal with what happens when those people violate it, what happens when we need to enforce it. Um, and that's why these poor suckers are up here. Um, 
these are the first of what we're calling the community operators. They're specifically tasked with not running the network, we already have that staff, with essentially guiding the community. Um, and I'll let them introduce themselves here in a second, but the, the notion is this is still a work in progress. Um, it is not done and it will never really be done. Um, but we want to make sure everyone knows that we're having a BOF tomorrow, we're still at 10. Um, to talk about this, we're working through some of the policies and want to make sure everyone is willing, well, everyone knows that you can come and have feedback and help us build this community for you. This is your IRC network. It will be what you want it to be. Um, and if you're not, a, I'm going to be kind of a jackass here for a second. Um, we've gotten out of the thousands of, well, thousands, fine then. Um, of the thousand or so users that are on the network, I've gotten feedback from five of you, despite the fact that we've been in, I'm short, leave me alone, um, despite the fact that this has been going on for two months. So I'd like to get more feedback from the... <laughs> from the 1,046 of you in 434 channels when I looked last night, I'd like you to give us more feedback because this is for you. This is about you. Um, so please come to the BOF tomorrow and I will let these fine people who are helping us come up here and introduce themselves. Um, these are folks that you can come to when you have problems or questions um, and they will do their best to help you. Hi, I'm Garu. And uh, at I stand by, by Sung, I mean, what he said. He's an awesome guy, and we're really trying to make this for you guys in order to make uh, irc.pearl.org a better place, and for you specifically. So there you go. Hi, I'm Karen Etheridge. I go by Ether. Um, yeah, I've, I've, been using, I've, I've been using Pearl for about 15 years, and it wasn't until I joined IRC that I really got good and join the community. So I think IRC is awesome. And if anyone doesn't think IRC is awesome, I want to make it awesome for you too. Thanks. Hi, I'm John Anderson. I, I go by Gene Hack online most places. <laughs> what everybody else said. <laughs> and he's not here because he's running a conference. Um, Chris Peregrine, no, Chris, Prather, a.k.a. Peregrine, um, is leading the, the movement, is leading the community oppers so that I can step back from all of this and these nice, much nicer than me folks, um, can do this for you. So again, 10 a.m. tomorrow, we're doing the BOF. Please show up and help us uh, guide this for you. Gong us. There we go. Um, I talked about Fostem. Of course, Fostem is in Brussels and Belgium. So that's one. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is the Dutch Pearl Workshop. See? Dutch Pearl Workshop. This year, it was awesome. Next year, 10 of, uh, April 10 in, uh, in Utrecht again. It will be awesome again. Uh, we, uh, this year, we, we doubled in size of number of attendees and number of talks. We want to do that again. So see you see us next year in Utrecht in the Netherlands. Thank you. I work in the Detroit of, uh, of, of, of programming languages, right? I, uh, I work for the Detroit of websites. Uh, I uh, live near the Detroit of cities, actually the Toledo of cities, which is worse. Uh, but I do not attend the Detroit of Pearl mongers. Uh, but, but, uh, but Pearl's not dead. Slashot's not dead. Detroit is not dead. But the Detroit Pearl mongers is dead. So uh, if anybody else is, lives in Detroit or near Detroit like me, uh, I would really like to get Detroit PM going again, so please find me. I'm Tolemark or David Hand, so uh, yeah.
Justin. All right. Um, I'm David Farrell from. It's not working. Oh, okay. How's this? Okay. So, I'm David Farrell from PearlTricks.com, and I'm here to talk about why pearl writing is like a dungeon hack. <laughs> Let me explain. So, when you set out to be a pearl writer, you need to think about what type of writer you want to be. So, do you want to be a master trainer like Brian Foy, you know, writing? Uh, 60 hertz. Yeah, I didn't know how to change it. Okay, so um, if you're going to be a master trainer like Brian Foy, writing uh, technical articles and, and programming books, or maybe you'd rather be an essayist like Buddy Burden, whose articles don't contain much code, but they're full of beautiful prose, or maybe you prefer a hybrid approach, like a coder blogger, like Chromatic, but you really want to think about what type of writer you want to be. Um, nothing attracts hordes of readers, like a catchy title for your articles. So I've prepared some scrolls for you to uh, derive catchy formulas for your titles, uh, catchy titles for your articles. So for instance, the keyword guide to X. So in this case, um, the keyword needs to be a hook word like uh, best or worst, something that piques the reader's interest. So the ultimate guide to Modulinos, that works well. N ways to die uh, M ways to X, so that's uh, five ways to die in Perl. That's the listicle approach. So um, one thing to keep in mind if you use a listicle uh, title is that um, Tim Toady, if you write five ways to die in Perl, I guarantee someone will email you and say there's a sick way to die in Perl and you didn't write about it. But that goes with the territory. Um, X you should know. So this is the social proofing title, right? Everybody knows this thing, you should know it too. So, uh, Pearl Tokens You Should Know, that's a great title too. And the key thing with the title is, make sure that you deliver on the promise of the title in the body of your article. So, if you write five ways to die in Pearl, make sure your article has five ways to die in Pearl. That works great. Um, so, everybody knows that dice gods favor the brave, and writing is kind of like that. So um, writing that expresses an opinion is intuitively more interesting than writing that sits on the fence. So CGI has some drawbacks is a very reasonable statement, but CGI must die is a lot more interesting. In fact, CGI has died because it's been removed from core as of 520. So, if you're writing and uh, you're frequently encountering, if you encounter someone who's frequently uh, posting negative comments, you may be dealing with a troll. And I found the best way to deal with trolls is not to engage them at all. Um, have a thick skin, like don't take what they say to heart. They often pick up on your weak points. And make sure that you distinguish between people who provide critical feedback and people who are trolling because critical feedback can be really helpful, it can make your writing better, and make it appeal to a wider audience. Oh yeah, so um, test your code before you publish your article. There's nothing more embarrassing than having a spell fail in public. For example, this subroutine looks great on paper, but if you were to run it, it doesn't work. And so we've got an error in our class, but because we've run the code, we can fix the error, and now the code runs great. So if you're thinking about being a Perl writer or writing about Perl, um, I'd really encourage you to do so. There's a lot of benefits. Uh, you can level up your Perl skill as you learn more about more features of the language that you wouldn't otherwise be exposed to. You can earn gold when writers pay you, for, uh, when companies pay you for your articles or through earning ad revenue on your own website. And your reputation will soar as the community uh, comes to appreciate your great writing and your contribution. And maybe one day, you can achieve the rank of heroic linguists. <laughs> Thank you.
So, so you want to uh, you want to have a nice job. You know this nice company, and uh, they you know that they have awesome jobs. And you want to work there. There are several ways to do that, of course. Uh, one way is to prepare, like I'm not going to tell you. It's a very nice company, but still. Oh, hang on, that helps. Okay. Um, you know that they want people that are able to do specific things. I don't care what it is, but you know what, it, what they are, so you have to work on that. Um, first thing you have to do is find yourself. Make sure that you can be found. Check what company X will see when they are going to search for you. Try it for yourself. Type in your name, Google, DuckDuckGo and other search engines. Of course, DuckDuckGo is a very nice one, they use Pearl. Um, if you're not there, if you cannot be found, what do you, what do you expect that any company might be interested in you? Or if what you find is well, boring or bad, why would they be interested in you? So make sure that you prepare yourself to make yourself interesting and findable. Use a couple of months, maybe even a whole year, because if you are re rejected at a company, it might take at least a year if they want to speak you, to you again, if they want to speak to you ever again. Anyway, um, of course, be sure that you know your pearl or whatever subject you're going to do, whatever thing you're going to do for that company. Um, should, you should have examples of your code. Be proud of that code. Be sure that if you look at your code, they think, yes, I made that. Whipping arms and stuff too much. Um, at least read some books or online manuals. Know, know the security issues that you have to deal with. Um, know about the different implementations of Perl. Okay, make yourself visible. Join a Perlmonger group, work on modules on CPAN, blog, publish, 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 write a lot. Review other people's stuff. Speak at workshops and conferences. Hey, I'm doing that. Uh, participate at a hackathon. Uh, become a member of a team of developers like um, Perl6, uh, P5Mob, uh, Catalyst. And whatever you write about stuff that you do, be honest about it. Don't lie because other people will find you out and t write about that. And there will be bad stuff about you. And you don't want that because then you, that company won't hire you. Like I said, Perlmonger Group, listen to pre pre presentations uh, and speak at, present at Perlmonger Groups. It's a very nice way to practice for speaking in, in, in public, like I'm doing now. Still nervous, but I'm doing it. Um, also, give presentations there. Again, very nice to get practice. Um, after that, uh, at some point, help with organization of events, like Perlmonger Groups or workshops or hackathons or CPAN modules. Test, test modules. Okay, keep talking. Um, test modules. Uh, test other people's modules and write about it. Um, file bug reports, send in patches. Uh, submit uh, feature requests and implement those feature requests. This makes you findable. It makes you interesting as well. Um, at some point you will have your own modules on CPAN. Makes you even more interesting. Uh, publish. There's a lot of ways to publish. You know them. It's a lot. Right, 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 right. Speak. Speak, speak, speak. Um, everywhere. I'm almost done. Um, <laughs> go to a hackathon, be productive, be prepared. If you go to a hackathon, just don't come there like, oh, tell me what to do. No. Have a list of things you're going to do. Know what other people are going to do. Be prepared to work on their stuff as well. At some point, people will come to you. Hey, you've done this. Help me. Uh, be a developer. Uh, dance a catalyst, modulation, etc. Do good stuff. Be helpful. Uh, start with the low hanging fruit. Documentation is a nice thing to start with. Testing is also easy. At some point it gets difficult, more and more difficult, and you become more experienced at what you do. Um, at the job interview, look good and clean, have a good mood, etc. etc. Um, at the end, of course, 
no real value because you want to earn some money. So I wish you good luck, but that's not all. Because when you've done all of that, you will be so damn interesting that other companies come to you and offer you a job. M might be even more interesting than the job you wanted. Thank you, that's all. Hi, quick advertisement. My name is Jay Hanna, and I am the uh, de facto international Pearlmonger's chief ticket monkey. Uh, if you don't know what the Pearlmongers are, please go to pm.org and check it out. Hopefully you have a local Pearlmongers group in your area, wherever you're from. I think a lot of people are from out of town. Look on that website. If you don't see a group, congratulations, you are now the group leader for your city. <laughs> In any event, please email support at pm.org and we'll get to it as soon as I stop slacking off because I've been slacking off at a conference lately. So, uh, but I'll get to your ticket and uh, please check it out, Pearlmongers, pm.org. Thank you very much. So that's the end of the lightning talks for today. We have two more sets still tomorrow and Wednesday. If you are speaking for those days, remember, please sit up front so we have you all. There's some technical problems today. We're going to try to get that ironed out. An extra incentive for you to want to do it, Lightning Talk speakers are getting a merit badge. It has a Velociraptor on it. So it is now lunchtime. Sort among yourselves. The wiki does give some suggestions. And there is a buffet downstairs for up to 80 people. <laughs>